Shortly afterward, he incorporated this sculpture into a still life, frankly not to any great effect. Still life doesn't seem to be very much affected by it at all. Um, and in fact, it wasn't until uh, the following year <clears throat> in Blue Nude, which he showed at the 1907 Salon des Indépendants that spring, <clears throat> that he began to synthesize, and this is very important, African sculpture into his painting. In terms of the, uh, the sort of the way in which he deals with the hips, the way in which he deals with the breast in relation to the body, the um, com the proportions of the body. Not so, they're not particularly African proportions where the legs tend to be shorter, but the way in which he compresses and extends various parts of the body show very strongly the way in which he was now thinking in terms of invented planes and proportions of the human body in relation to what he learned from African art. And this is something that would continue over the next several years. In his decorative figure of 1908, in uh, the painting on the left-hand side, which is almost like a French model reconceived as a Fong figure seated in a chair. Strikingly, in the head of his portrait of his wife of 1913, which strongly resemble, resembles Punu masks. And very strikingly, in Jeanette 5 of 1916, the last in a series of five sculptures, which he radically reinvented shortly after he had purchased the Bamana sculpture on the right-hand side. Now, in this history, Picasso holds a, spe a position of special importance. His engagement with African art was more overt than anyone else's, and he ranged more freely between morphological and conceptual responses to it. By the end of 1906, he had seen the works that Matisse and uh, Durand owned, and, of course, when this happened, when he met Matisse at Gertrude Stein's, he had just finished painting the portrait of Gertrude Stein, and he already had been very much affected by archaic styles through the whole year of 1906. And it seems to me that the work that really set him off, though, was Matisse's Blue Nude of 1907, which was such a radical painting, which was so aggressive and so aggressively af Africanizing that it seems to be the work that really sent him to the Trocadero Museum only a couple of months later. And there, in that famous encounter, he was not drawn only to the form, but what he understood to be the magical function of African art. He realized something <clears throat> that no one else had apparently realized. In Africa, art is meant to be used not merely looked at. Once you consider the primary function of a work of art to be that of simply being looked at, it can no longer function in any but a directly passive, isolated way. And Picasso sought a more active role for the art object. This is reflected in his famous account of how the Demoiselle d'Avignon came into being that he recounted to André Malraux, and I give you an abbreviated version of it, in which he talks about how uh, the Impressionists had, uh, Van Gogh in particular, had Japanese prints as a source of inspiration. And he and his generation uh, were inspired similarly by African art. And then he says um, that for Matisse and Durand, the masks were sculpture, no more than that. When Matisse showed me his first Negro head, he talked about Egyptian art. But when I went to the Musée de l'Homme, the masks were not just sculpture, not in the least. They were magical objects. Now, the Negro sculptors were intercessors. I've known the French word ever since then. Intercessors against everything, against unknown threatening spirits. I understood what their sculpture did for the Negroes, why they carved them that way and not some other way. They were weapons to keep people from being ruled by spirits, to help them free themselves, tools. Les Demoiselles d'Avignon must have come to me that day not because of the forms, but because it was my first canvas of exorcism. Exorcism, we might ask, of what? But if I did that, we'd be here for the whole day. So I won't quite pose the question that way, but I'd like to say, let's consider, aside from his own personal sexuality, what kinds of exorcism this painting would, would embody culturally. Uh, this painting that 
has become so iconic that it's seen as a kind, uh, symptomatic also of the violence and disruption of the whole century uh, that was to follow it. And I think one can say fairly that it is a painting which unfathomable fathomable in its subtleties and ambiguities, nonetheless is a picture that really is a prime example of how an artist can transform his own psychological tensions into an image that expresses those of the culture at large. Now, one of the first aspects of exorcism in this painting is the exorcism of proficiency in polish so characteristic of the academic tradition which, in which Picasso had been trained, not insignificantly, I think, by his own father. And this is a painting he did when he was uh, 13 or 14 years old. So as you can see, he got it down pretty well. Another, um, th therefore, this, the, the Demoiselle d'Avignon, among other things, was related to the need he had to break his own virtuosity to find new ancestors in a rather literal sense of choosing a new culture and a new father. By his own account, he said that contrary to what happens in music, the children, uh, I'm sorry, uh, children are not naturally gifted as painters. And he says, in fact, children have a kind of primitive, um, spontaneous artistic talent which can only be killed by overtraining. And then he talks about how his father um, did that to him. And he said, I, I never really had a childhood as an artist. He said, at that boy's age, I was making drawings that were completely academic. Their precision, their exactitude frightens me. My father was a professor of drawing, and it was probably he who pushed me prematurely in that direction. So what he's talking about is the missing childhood, which is to some degree Baudelaire's missing childhood. It's the childhood to be recovered at will, which is genius. And if we look at First Communion and in relation to what he painted in 1907 around the time that he did to Demoiselle d'Avignon and the, the sort of the, what he's getting rid of and what he's moving toward, we see that um, Picasso in the Demoiselle and related painting was openly set in opposition the mixed feelings about Africa and about otherness in general that went back to the beginning of Western engagement with the continent of Africa. The African colonies were conceived of in two different but complementary ways, both of which suited the colonial ambitions of the European powers. On the one hand, it was the romanticized view that Africans embodied a surviving instance of the noble savage, a pre-civilized state of humanity that worshiped nature, gods, and whose naturalness and authenticity was set in contrast to the decadent West. On the other hand, Africa was thought of as a continent of human sacrifice, cannibalism, witchcraft, and mysterious primeval spirits. Africa was at once attractive and repellent, grotesque and beautiful. And this duality was also extended to African art. So in exercising traditional notions of beauty from the Demoiselle d'Avignon, Picasso was also exercising and rebalancing ideas about cultural supremacy. Now, I should also say he was not only exercising his biological father, he was also exercising his spiritual father because in the last year or so, Picasso had very much fallen under the influence of Cezanne. And in fact, in the early uh, studies, one of the earliest full studies for the composition, as you can see, it's very Cezanne-like. And in fact, in the final painting, he goes out of his way to paint this figure. See what this is, uh, Cezanne Bather? this crouching figure, which is a common figure um, in Cezanne's bather paintings and is the most grotesque figure in the whole composition and also the most kind of torturous in how he's trying to realize it. It's perhaps not coincidental also that the painting on the right-hand side belonged to Matisse at the time. 